Let's start with a prayer. Father, I pray that you'll take my words and our thoughts and that you'll mould them to your will so that what we hear back will be your desires for us. Amen. So, here's a picture of a dog. And here's one of a lovely cat. If I asked you to say whether you prefer dogs or cats, I suspect that we'd have roughly equal groups of dog lovers, cat lovers, and those who can't quite make their mind up and love both. If, however, I asked you which one of you thought was more faithful, I imagine that by far the majority would choose the dog. It's difficult to imagine a cat galloping towards you when you call it or getting on its hind legs to beg for a treat, or waiting patiently at the door for you when you return from work or the shops. If a cat comes purring towards you, it's probably after food or a warm spot to sleep on. And whilst a dog is capable of being mercenary, we also see that it exhibits the sort of loyalty and desire to be obedient that we expect a faithful nature to show. And faithfulness, the fruit of the Spirit, is what we're looking at today. And from the example that we've just thought about, we can see how we instinctively know what it means to be faithful before we even start thinking about what it really means. The words we might think of to describe a faithful dog are words like reliable, dedicated, loyal. Obviously, faithfulness between people and between God and his people carries a greater range of emotion than between us and dogs, but the words still hold up. So how do we become faithful and how do we stay faithful? First, how do we become faithful? We have to have faith in the person or cause that we're going to be faithful to. And the only reason that we have faith in someone is because we see that they are able to be faithful themselves. The hymns and songs that we've sung today are all about God's faithfulness to his people. In fact, I could have chosen just about any passage from the Bible. The whole Bible is a record of God's promises to us and how he has kept them. Either it is God proclaiming it or the writers of the Bible reminding themselves of it. That's what the psalmist in Psalm 143 is doing. But that does beg the question, why is God faithful to us? God's faithfulness is different to ours. We can be faithful to God because he is faithful to us. But God is faithful to us because it is his character to be faithful. He can be nothing other than faithful. If he was unfaithful, then we wouldn't be able to know him or trust him. Think about it. If a friend lets us down once in a while, we will accept that things can happen and their reason for it happening. But if a friend lets us down every time, we learn not to trust them in the area where they've let us down. We might remain friends with them, but we'll always have problems of trust. So at this point, let's turn to Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas, but I think that's unfair. He wasn't around when the other disciples met with the risen Jesus, and suddenly they're babbling to him about something that was simply impossible. He would have felt very sore. He'd been let down by Jesus, who had promised so much, and then been so easily duped and killed by the Roman and Jewish authorities. He'd been let down by the other disciples, with whom he'd spent three intense years, but they don't seem to have included him when it mattered. And he would have felt that he had let himself down by fleeing from the scene of Jesus' arrest. So, somewhat unkindly, he sets a test that he thought would show how impossible this story was, and would shame the rest of them for their wicked joke on him. 
that he would believe when he could put his hands into Jesus' wounds. But of course it wasn't impossible. In a short encounter with Jesus, Thomas is rescued from all his despair, doubt and lack of trust. He is reminded that Jesus has not let him down, but that it was that he hadn't understood what was happening. Jesus restores him and that liberates him to confess, my Lord and my God. Jesus doesn't quite let him off the hook. Subtly but firmly, he reminds Thomas that he has the benefit of seeing Jesus. Many others, including all of us, won't have that. So that does lead to the second question. How do we stay faithful? When life went awry for Thomas, he had the solution handed to him on a plate. Only a handful could ever benefit from that level of evidence. For us, memory is the key. Not memory in the sense of what was the breed of dog I showed you at the start of this talk, and it was a border collie if you're really interested. It's memory in the sense of remembering what God has done for us. In Psalm 143 that we heard earlier, the psalmist does the work. They are clearly facing desperate times, pursued by their enemy, crushed to the ground, dwelling in darkness, and so on. So the psalmist thinks back to what God has done for them. They don't whitewash what is happening in their life or make everything sound perfect. It's been a long time since they saw God's faithfulness. They would like a quick answer. But the remembering helps them to remember that God never lets them down. It doesn't necessarily get them out of the immediate tight spot they're in, but it does set their thinking straight and the framework by which they understand the world. The fact is, faithfulness is believing that God is who he says he is and continuing in that belief despite the vagaries of life. That means we trust what God says to us through his revealed word and not necessarily what the world or our own eyes tell us. We trust that he will work out everything for good. We trust he will work his will in us. And we trust that our situation on earth is nothing compared to our future reward in heaven. The fact is, faithfulness can only grow and be exhibited when we face these challenges. The only way we can have such faith is by the Holy Spirit's influence. He testifies to the truth and impels us to seek God. The Spirit makes us faithful which is why it is one of the fruits. And as we develop this fruit, then our faithfulness will become more like God's. It will simply become part of our character, like God, something we do, something that we are. But what does this look like? It all sounds terribly holy, and we will all be thinking that I can't possibly be like that. I think it's appropriate to answer that, by reflecting on the life of Prince Philip. One of the overriding themes that has shone through all the coverage about his life is his dedication to his wife, the Queen, and his service to his country. But it wasn't easy. There is clear testimony about the shock he felt at the news of the death of King George, as he realised how it would curtail his freedoms. His struggles as a man with unconventional ways of thinking, trapped by the protocols of state, are well documented. He could be acerbic to the point of rudeness. Yet despite all of this, he turned his life to service. Our own approach to being faithful to God will see similar fights and tantrums in us. But faithfulness is everything. Being faithful is not the flashiest of characteristics, but it is the one we most respect, and it is the bedrock of our Christian faith and beliefs. As Archbishop Justin Welby said in the tribute to Prince Philip that Andrea read out, serving others might not be visible, but is always essential. 
I am certain that of the torrent of words that will be expressed about Prince Philip over the next few days, the only ones that will really matter are six words from Jesus. Well done, good and faithful servant. And the same will be true for us. Amen.